And of course, I mention this because there's a change maker connection in there as well, of course, because your involvement with the Surfers Against Sewage group. How did that come about? I know we're jumping around the timeline yeah. a bit, but. Yeah, so after our plastics announcement to fully eliminate plastic by 2023, it obviously created a big media storm. And um, we did a lot of outreach to NGOs, to different people. And, and there's uh, a very cool customer called um, Hugo Tagholm, who's the boss of service, Surfers Against Sewage, who's a, um, a bit of a force, really. And uh, he reached out to me on Twitter. And we, we met for a coffee, I think, in London and, and kind of grew a friendship. And then we hung out a bit and went surfing together. We both have a love for Cornwall, uh, where I spend a lot of my time on holidays. And uh, yeah, then eventually he asked me to become a, a trustee, which is um, something I never thought I'd be when I started out surfing. And, you know, I was I was so proud to, to become uh, a trustee of that, that charity, which is steeped in, you know, so, so much history and so much authenticity. And it's a yes. real genuine voice of the, the ocean. So it was a real honor to accept it. And also to be involved in a charity that is really going places. And I always say about Hugo, he'd be the ultimate business case study if he was running a business. Yes. You know, when he took over 10 years ago, it was days from bankruptcy and you know, it was uh, potentially he might have to close it, but he's grown it and grown it. That's interesting. I mean, I have been involved with environmental issues of some sort or another over a couple of decades. I probably don't want to think about how much longer actually it might be than that. And Surface Against Sewage was something that was a force long, long ago. And obviously it's gone through various sort of vicissitudes in its history since then. But um, nevertheless, they, they have made a splash, mm. as it were. <laughs> oh dear. Um, and, uh, yeah, remarkable group. And, and actually even more remarkable that they're going now and going so strongly now. Yeah. And that's not without its challenges. You know, they're now, they were the royal wedding charity at Harry and Meghan's wedding, uh, which is fabulous endorsement and reaches whole new audience. But then they're desperate to keep the authenticity and, you know, keep their roots from where they started in St. Agnes in Cornwall. So they have to walk that tightrope and balance it like, like any, anyone. Yes. And of course, well before you ever came to Iceland, um, the company had made some waves of its own in the sustainability space. I guess it would have been when you were at university, when the GM yeah. food thing came up. So it became the first UK retailer to say that it wouldn't take GM food. First retailer right? in the world. Yes. Yeah. And, and created a small sensation of lots of people saying how ridiculous and then very quickly following suit soon after. Yeah. And then actually not too long after that, uh, an interesting sort of other exercise where um, it announced that it would go all organic, yeah. which achieved considerably less acclaim and, and didn't <laughs> stick quite as much. So were you following all of that at the time? And what, what's your take on all of that, looking back on it now? Yeah, I was, I was following it, if only because um, the, the guy absolutely kind of with the personal conviction that, that was leading the charge was my dad. So we'd talk about it as a family. But... Um, you know, he, he felt so passionately about these issues and really kind of, um, you know, made a stand, was disruptive, very counter to the um, industry uh, and d doing what Iceland does best, which is um, zigging when others zag and, and, and being a corporate activist. And they, they were incredible campaigns, really, really changed the game, as you said. Um, and organic probably was a, a step too far. I mean, there are other circumstances as well, a change of management. Dad left the business um, a little bit later before coming back in. But um, yeah, it was probably a, a step too far, but I think it, it- And it was a step too far because it was a step too far for the customers. Yeah, I think so. And maybe, you know, an education piece around what organic is and some of the benefits. And the organic argument's interesting. It's, it's developed over the last 20 years I mean, true environmentalists have always appreciated the environmental bene benefits of organic, but actually a lot of the narrative and the PR was around human health. Actually, now I think when we're looking at declines of pollinators around the world, we're, we're suddenly starting to appreciate that low input agricultural systems are, are way better for the planet. Yes. Because I remember it for, at the time, which, uh, you know, we're going back a long way. So my memories uh, are prone to be a little on the um, creative side, maybe. But it seemed from what I was reading then, that basically customers didn't understand it. 
and they didn't believe the message that said we're not going to raise prices over this mm. which that's, that was that was my memory of it in any case which is one of those interesting sort of things because i'm always interested in the challenge how do you take your customers with you when you know change has to happen but it's not change that the customers are asking for yes and i guess we're in that zone today because there are all sorts of issues in front of us and we'll talk about some of those uh, in a moment but you always have to be one or two steps ahead of the customers you can never afford to be three or four yeah no that's true and and maybe it, it was ahead of its time i think the the will you charge more question is a really interesting one because that was always the first question that was thrown at me when we announced the removal of plastics from the packaging or palm oil especially from from the products and uh th this is what gets me so excited. A lot of retailer sustainability models are based on charging more for products that are healthier for the environment, which they're totally transparent about, and that's fine. That's how they make it work. But actually, to my mind, that's not genuine sustainability because it's not democratizing environmentalism. It's keeping it as the preserve for rich people who can afford to care about it. And then it makes this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy of environmentalism just being virtue signaling between the middle classes, you know? Yes. I'm intrigued that on your way into Iceland, you worked for a year as a shelf stacker and cashier. So no one can claim that on the basis of family connections, you just parachuted into a top job, I suppose. I know some leaders make a habit of spending you know, a week, a year or yeah. something like that on the front line doing these sorts of things. What did you get from doing that sort of role for, for that length of time? And how's that stayed with you now? It was amazing. I mean, it was, uh, I look back and it was a real kind of uh, point in my life where I think I learned a lot and experienced a lot. And, you know, I'd obviously had a gilded upbringing and then I'd been in uh, the property game, you know, in Mayfair and a very different world. And then um, spending a year properly, you know, um, uh, five, six, sometimes seven days a week on as a frontline colleague in, in stores around London, some of them pretty rough and tough stores. And I think firstly, it obviously gave me a real appreciation for the, the nuts and bolts of the operation of the business and how it's run and who our customer is and you know what, what they like to buy and, um, and all of that piece. But actually more than that, it, it, it was a real hum, humbling experience because you appreciate what some of our colleagues have to go through you know, yeah. be it um, shoplifters or, or abuse from from uh, customers or whatever it might be, you know, and some of the hours as well that they have to put in, which often when we're sat here at head office, you know, uh, issuing commands from upon high, we don't fully appreciate the, the consequences that has on our 25,000 staff. Yes, yes. And what was it that then finally tipped you over to coming here in the first place? Having decided you definitely weren't. <laughs> something and you even started your own property firm three years later when you made the move something significant must have happened in your thinking yeah well a few things happened uh the property business we grew it very successfully i, I moved to poland and, and built a, a company out there and sold that and then we set up a new fund in london raised some new money and actually that business has continued to grow and is very successful and it's something I'm actually very proud of, you know, and, and I remain chairman and it's great to kind of watch it grow now run by others. Uh, in fact, I always joke, it's, it's done much better since I left. But I think, <laughs> I think that gave me enough kind of um, confidence and maturity and also thick skin, you know, not easy doing, uh, running a startup in Poland in 2006. Um, pr pretty formative years in, in that sense. And I think that, that gave me the confidence to come into Iceland. Um, but other things happened as well. You know, dad, by that point in 2012 or 13, had bought the business private again. So once again, it felt like a private business. And there was kind of, you know, interesting um, thought process there going on around legacy and um, th this incredible institution, this community, communities of people all around the UK that had really been started by, yes, by dad, but also mum. And, you know, we, we don't kind of reference my mum enough, really. Uh, she thought of the name and, and started the business jointly with dad. And she was working on, on as the cashier whilst dad was stacking the shelves and doing the books at the end of the week. And uh, mum got very ill. Um, and she has now late stage Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, for me, that was quite a turning point as well. That um, I realised, you know, this is quite a, a precious family business and something that I really want to kind of pick up 
and run, but in my own way. Yes. And it was important to you that it had become a sort of private company again. Life within a PLC just didn't appeal at all, I assume. No, I mean, that certainly, you know, I was fed the medicine from dad growing up that uh, PLCs are, you know, you spend your whole life uh, trying to please teenage scribblers, as he'd call them in the city. And <laughs> they're only ever interested in short termism and that engenders the wrong type yes. of um, uh, business management. So, you know, it was very liberating that, you know, running a private business once again and, and being able to afford that long term view. Do you think that the company <clears throat> could have the commitment to sustainability that it has in the way that it has, the courage that it's shown in taking a lead in some of the areas, if it was a PLC? Does no. the system completely militate against that? Leadership? Yeah, I think I think it is possible. And, you know, the likes of Paul Polman are a testament to the fact that it is um, it, it is possible to balance purpose and profit when you're a publicly traded business. But um, it's certainly, it's part of our DNA anyway, that Iceland is uh, maverick and we are cowboys and, you know, we, we, we do like to do things differently and, and, and be disruptive. Um, but I do think being a private business enables us to, to think longer term and it would be very difficult to load up millions of pounds worth of costs, you know, by removing plastics and palm oil if we were continually having to chase short term profits. Yeah. OK, well, let's talk about some of the specific things you've been doing. And we've mentioned it a couple of times because one of the ways you made a big splash was on the commitment on palm oil. You decided to remove palm oil from Iceland branded products. You promoted this fact with a campaigning Greenpeace video featuring an orangutan. And there are orangutans Everywhere. all over the head office. I can testify <laughs> this to anyone. Uh, um, Who doesn't love an orangutan? Well, absolutely. And, and you promoted this fact with, with a campaigning Greenpeace video that became Iceland's Christmas ad. And this was what got a lot of attention because, of course, the ad was banned because it was a political campaigning video as far as uh, the regulators were concerned. Why did you take the decision to go zero palm oil? It was uh, a very controversial decision because to date, all of the narrative had been around sustainable palm oil. And I, as a long term member of Greenpeace, I had very uh, strong reservations around the palm oil industry and whether there was such a thing as genuinely sustainable palm. So I actually went out in person to West Kalimantan the front line of the palm oil industry to have a look for myself. And I think the most important thing as a business leader is to witness personally, you know, some some of these some of these big issues. And then and then you have the authority to be able to um, have a view. And we went to the primary rainforest, which was absolutely extraordinary. You can see the level of biodiversity. We camped in the rainforest for two or three nights. It was waded up to our necks in peat swamps. It was it was just extraordinary. But then we went to these vast palm monocultures where there was nothing but palm trees from one horizon to the next. And the most extraordinary thing was having been spent several nights in the rainforest to then go to these monocultures, they're, they're just dead. There's no noise at all. You know, you, you couldn't sleep at night in the primary rainforest because it was so loud and deafening, the nature. Whereas uh, you could hear a pin drop. In, in these palm cultures. And when we, uh, when we took a domestic flight for about an hour, we were looking down, it was a clear day, we saw nothing but palm oil plantations uh, below us on the ground. So the industrial scale of it was quite shocking. But we also met uh, local communities who've been displaced uh, by um, foreign owned um, multinational palm oil companies. And we also went to animal rescue uh, charities and saw you know, the likes of orangutans that had been killed or, or brutalized um, to make way for, for palm. So the reason we did it was not because we were anti-palm oil, but it was to throw the gauntlet down in a very noisy and effective way as a protest to say, until there is such time as genuinely sustainable palm oil, we're saying no to palm oil. And you know, we, we did it to shake up the industry and to start debate. And I think we certainly did that. And I'm proud of that. that. Yes. Because in many ways, if you were to have a description of oil palm on paper without any of this context, you would say it was one of the most sustainable plants on the planet. Because in terms of the quantity of 
useful vegetable oil, almost ubiquitously useful vegetable oil, which of course mm. is why it's in everything, you get way more, well, at least you get more per plant than you get from any other source of vegetable oil, as far as I'm aware. Seven times more. Fear, seven times more, which theoretically makes it an incredibly sustainable plant. Yeah. How do we move beyond the context to say, well, look, demonstrably, this isn't about the plant itself. It's about the way that this is being done at the moment. Whatever we do to create vegetable oil for the world of seven, eight growing billion population, it's going to go to scale. Isn't the problem the scale rather than the palm? In which case, starting the debate is, is just the beginning. Mm. Where do we go from here? Yeah. And I, I agree with all of that. You know, palm, and this is where there are so many similarities to plastic. It is an amazing ingredient. You know, it's in 50% of all supermarket products because it is so useful and so cheap. And it's so cheap because it's so high yielding and therefore it requires a lot less land. So on the face of it, really good. The problem is it's exclusively grown in areas of tropical rainforest. And they're the crown jewels of our planet. They're only 2% of the land area, but they're 50% of all of our biodiversity. And we're trashing them at a rate of 150 football pitches plus every single hour being chopped or burnt down to make way for palm. Um, and you, you're entirely right that the, the issue is one of scale. And we kept repeating the fact we are not anti-palm oil, we're anti-deforestation. And in, until the industry can pledge and prove zero deforestation, we are stepping out as a protest. Um, but of course, palm oil absolutely has a place. You know, it, it, like I said, it's a miracle in, ingredient, but we just need to readdress our relationship with it. And as ever with humanity, not be so binary. You know, it, why does it have to be all plastic? Why does it have to be all palm oil? We need a range in our toolkit if we're to live on this planet sustainably. And palm oil absolutely has a role to play in that. I would argue the fact that it's in 50% of everything is, is too, too much. Uh, but any palm oil should have zero deforestation. And that's why at the end of last year, it was so heartening to see the industry finally wake up and pledge new uh, policies around zero deforestation. And do some of the alternatives to palm oil depend less on the environment that you would go to the areas of rainforest in order to, to create? Because that seems to be the issue. Yeah, so um, we replaced palm oil a lot with rapeseed oil. Where that rapeseed oil comes from is particularly important. It could come from temperate rainforests in China where the panda bear is under threat because of deforestation. Or it could come, as ours does, from a field in Lincolnshire and whilst Lincolnshire's very beautiful, you can't compare one square inch of tropical rainforest to vast fields of uh, no. fields in Lincolnshire in terms of biodiversity value. No, indeed. And yes, rapeseed is. I live in East Anglia, so there you uh, go. this is one of the, <laughs> the things that is my daily uh, existence. Yeah. You survived a heavy pummeling from Piers Morgan on this question when when you. I mean, he wasn't the only. Not uh, just pummeling, but people try to deliver <laughs> at that point, of course, which which is just testament to how big an impact it made, I suppose. Did you take any lessons from those encounters? Because that must have been pretty much your, your earliest experience of, of how that cut and thrust of public debate, how, how the pointy end of that really can feel. Did you take any lessons from, from those in terms of how initiatives like these can get presented in popular culture and how to win the argument, basically. Hugely, yeah. I mean, you know, it, for the l last two years, there's been a, a, so much coverage, firstly on plastics and then palm oil. When we announced plastics, my very first interview was with Piers and Susanna at six in the morning, you know, and that was a baptism of fire. But um, I've learned a lot. And I think with regards to palm oil, I knew, for example, that, and I was warned that the, the industry would kick back and there would be some pretty unpleasant retaliation uh, from uh, Malaysia and Indonesia, which there most certainly was. But that was kind of par for the course and expected. What I didn't expect so much was, um, and maybe this is naivety on my part, but inbuilt cynicism and skepticism by the British media. And whilst I think uh, we need to speak truth to power and hold people to account, we have uh, a, a quite a, a British old-fashioned mentality of 
of being cynical and a negativity instinct of trying to look for the negative. And that might come after 20, 30 years of greenwash by corporations. But I'm now hearing a phrase in boardrooms about green hushing, which is where people don't, well, companies don't necessarily want to promote um, genuine uh, sustainable um, activities because they're general, generally worried about being tripped up by media looking to catch them out. Yes. I mean, it's certainly one of those things. I always thought greenwashing was a much smaller phenomenon than the cynics believed it to be, principally because the businesses that I'd spoken to over the years on corporate responsibility issues, the ones who were positioned as leaders got held to higher standards because journalists like nothing better than to catch somebody out who's supposed to be good, not being perfect. Yes, exactly. And they don't care too much about the ones in the middle who are really not quite that good because there's no story there. It's, it's, it's a man bites dog story versus a dog bites man story kind of thing, which I suppose is why you got a certain amount of grief when the BBC or whoever it was found one or two nuggets of palm oil still left you know, at, at a certain point mm. around the deadline of when you were trying to get them out and yeah. turn it into a big aha moment, yes. which is almost juvenile really in terms of how it yeah. point scoring type debate. But it was... Um you know, it was amazing how that story was picked up, you know, by the press and by the media. And it was a undercover investigation by the BBC. If the guy had called me and asked, of course, I would have told him the situation in terms of the transition on our product lines. That would have taken all the fun away. It, exactly. <laughs> in fact, I was emailing him desperately the day before saying, I want to speak to you. I can explain. He said, no, because he had premeditated his story and he was out to bury us. And whilst there is a inbuilt, inbuilt cynicism in the structure of the media, I think there is also, I might add, a bit of um, institutional snobbery around Iceland, the brand, because it's very comfortable and natural for the likes of Waitrose to be leading on stuff like this, but it's not entirely um, stable ground and, and, and is quite disruptive and unsettling for people if Iceland are leading on this. And therefore, there's always a tendency to say, ah, oh, well, I'm sure they're cheating somehow, let's catch them out. Yes. So moving on, you, we've mentioned again also you're committed to eliminating single-use plastic packaging from Iceland branded products. And I know that campaigners and onlookers generally tend to think that's a way easier thing to do than it actually is because they just think, here's some plastic around an item of food. It doesn't need to be there. And of course, particularly, often it does. Particularly um, accentuated by social media, you know, on Twitter. It's like, just... Get rid of this plastic now. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. This is. I did see some stats recently about how small a percentage of the population and how unrepresentative it was. It's actually on Twitter, which I must say <laughs> was the thing that's given me the most comfort of, of 2019, I think, really, because it can get pretty har hard on there. Yeah. But we do know that plastic, and particularly in relation to food products, there's all sorts of complicated trade-offs. What are the difficult problems that you're having to solve to make that commitment to zero plastics reality? Yeah. I mean, you know, first thing to say is the commitment is undoubtedly very bold, very ambitious. But, you know, I always argue that I would much rather uh, set a trajectory and get absolutely everyone in this head office and all of my 25,000, you know, store colleagues uh, in the stores pointed in that direction and being the drivers of change rather than sitting around and waiting for someone else to enact it. And I'm still confident and, and optimistic that, that we're going to get there, but there are challenges at every single turn. And, you know, they can come uh, predominantly around cost, but they can also come around packaging performance, uh, product quality, you know, you name it. There's, there's, um, there's challenges everywhere. The other thing that has happened in the 18 months since we announced, to my surprise, is that the industry has closed ranks around plastic. So I thought everyone would follow our lead and start to reduce plastic. And some people are, but um, in the main, if you look at uh, the Plastics Pact, if you look at a lot of the narrative, it's around recyclability, compostability, things like that. The reality is we are never going to solve the plastics problem if we focus on recycling. We're never going to recycle our way out of the plastics epidemic. We must turn down the tap of production in the first place. Yes. And... Uh, I fear that a lot of the R&D, a lot of the investment is going into uh, recycling, which will only ever lead to more and more plastic being produced. Yes. And I must say, as a standard consumer 
who relatively recently, it was a little while ago, but relatively recently, I had to educate myself that it was now okay to throw most plastic things into the recycling bin, checking always for the symbol. I don't have a huge amount of confidence that they're not ending up in a dump somewhere. Because it's not exactly been a perfect system, the UK recycling yeah. system. And this is a genuine great example of systemic change. You know, yes, we need retailers and business to step up and change, but we also need behavioural change from consumers. And we also, most importantly of all, I think, need uh, government to impose uh, harmonised waste recycling infrastructure and waste management infrastructure, because at the moment it's chaos. And we have so many different ways of doing things. And some boroughs don't recycle anything. And some boroughs recycle quite well. And it's it's complicated and impossible for a national retailer to fit one model that fits everywhere. Yes. So what sort of specific things have you had to overcome then? Because when I think about, I mean, obviously you deal with fresh food as well, but you're known for frozen food. And mm. Every frozen ready meal that I've ever seen will have a plastic sort of film on the top yeah. and often be in a plastic container. And yeah. obviously it's very cheap, I guess, and convenient to, to have that. What's yeah. the alternative? What, what are the solutions that you are finding? It with? is cheap and convenient. And the reality that we must face into is, despite what any survey says, you know, um, you, you customers love the convenience uh, and the value that plastic affords. You know, it, it, it is a, a miracle product. But yeah, we've, we've made big progress. So we, we produce 100 million uh, ready meals every year. And they previously came in, in black plastic trays. And they're as bad as it gets because they're single use, they're high carbon, you can't recycle them. We've now s switched pretty much uh, all of them uh, out of manufacture to FSC certified wooden board trays, uh, which is great. But we still have the plastic film on top. So people sometimes are quite literal in our plastic targets. So, so plastic today, that means no plastic tomorrow. And that's not the case. The only way we're going to climb a mountain as big as this is to do it incrementally and step by step and transition out of plastic over time and focus on what we can do because new solutions are coming all the time. Yes. But yeah, in terms of problems, I mean, you name it, you know, we've, we've switched luxury chilled steaks out of rigid plastic board to uh, paper, uh, but you can bend paper. And we noticed that stock loss, i.e. customers nicking, went through the roof and we couldn't work out why. So we, we had um, a few store detectives camp out in shops and watch what was going on. And the shoplifters within a week had worked out that you can bend the paper uh, luxury stakes much easier than uh, plastic. So they could bend it and stick it down their trousers and walk out with it. <laughs> so wow. we, we've had things like that. We've had sales challenges. You know, we deliberately uh, picked a working class area of Liverpool that didn't have a great recycling infrastructure and went completely loose on all our produce to see what would happen. And sales dropped 20%. That's not sustainability because I've got 25,000 mortgages, you know, that depend on me ensuring that I run this business Absolutely, in a profitable yeah. way. Um, so we have to rethink there. And presumably those people are still buying food from somewhere. So the fact they're finding it less attractive, they're not going on a diet because mm. they see this in your store. They say, that doesn't appeal to me. I'll, I'll buy something somewhere else where it does appeal to me. Yeah. So there's no solution at all in that no. sort of regard. No, but... Um, you know, I think we've learned how to trial better. It needs to be well thought through. Uh, but also we can we should expect failure as the, the first outcome. And then we iterate and we try again. So, for example, that loose produce trial has taught us one big thing, which is our customers love the convenience of pre-packed fresh produce. Fine. So now we're starting a new trial in 32 shops uh, in late September, which is going to have no plastic, but everything is pre-packaged. And we'll see what that does. And I'm sure there'll be many failures out of that, but there'll also be successes. It's one of the most important parts about innovative business, though, isn't it? Because you know, what was it they said about Edison tried the light bulb 98 times before, <laughs> or whatever it was? Do you know, I need to remind myself of that because it, it can be uh, disheartening, you know? Of course. A lot of the trials we do. But then occasionally you'll get a trial that is just an absolute slam dunk. And in Hackney, uh, last week, we went in the first retailer to go entirely plastic bag free. Many retailers now are offering a paper bag option, which might cost more, but we've we've kind of reworked the economics and we're now uh, charging 
15p for a, a paper bag um, and we also have a jute and a cotton bag and actually we're still selling the same amount of bags which means transactions haven't dropped which means cons customers are still coming in and that that is a total win and I want to roll it out. When businesses get heavily involved with sustainability particularly in the PLC setting they're always vulnerable to the charge that oh well the executives are taking their eye off the ball because they've, they've gone native and they care about this and they're not paying as much attention to business and you you made reference there to the importance of getting this sort of feedback and making sure those 25,000 mortgages continue to get paid across your workforce what have you learned about how you get the balance right between pushing ahead on this important work but making sure that the bottom line still holds up i mean we know that you can do be, you can be bolder because you're a private company yeah but ultimately, you still need to be a successful business. How, how do you shape that balance? You're sounding like my dad now. Don't take your eye off sales. <laughs> you know? And that's the thing. It's, um, you, you can become too much of one man's mission and take your eye off what is most important. And first and foremost is a healthy, successful, profitable business. And I look at sustainability in three different elements. Yes, there's what we all know, planetary sustainability, which is about animal welfare and environmental health. But actually, there's the health of uh, the business, which is so important because of those 25,000 mortgages and, um, and, and their lives. But then finally, there's the health of the communities that we serve as well, um, making sure that we employ people and also that we serve 5 million customers a week and provide them with high quality yet affordable products. Uh, so we're, we're trying to balance three different elements of sustainability, not just one. And that's why I sometimes, you know, I get frustrated with the debate. Some people will say, why are you still selling caged um, eggs in Iceland? That's appalling. And of course, I, I don't want to be selling caged eggs. But then I'm also proud of the fact that I can offer 10 eggs for a pound to someone who may only have £25 a week to spend on food and otherwise wouldn't get high quality protein um, if, if they weren't at those prices. So of course, we're working on a plan, we're transitioning out of, of caged, but we, we constantly having to balance not just good environmental stewardship. Yes. You have come to the fore as a plain speaking, fresh business voice in the, the UK. I mean, you're <laughs> on question time now, which to be fair, not many business people end up on question time, usually because mm -hmm. they're A, risk averse, and therefore wouldn't go anywhere near it and B, they're quite old and crusty and don't have <laughs> anything that's going to sparkle to the mainstream audience quite as much. And you, you have filled that spot. I mean, you were on there relatively recently talking about Brexit, which, well, obviously, if you're on Question Time, you're going to be talking about Brexit. That's true. about nothing else over the yeah. last three years. At least you know what the questions are going to be. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, of course, you disclosed then that you had been pro-Brexit, um, <clears throat> originally it's and presumably mm. still are um and that sort of means that theoretically now i have to dismiss you as a racist <laughs> and uh, and and yet you also think that we should have a referendum and therefore you know you're probably also betraying the country the point is the discourse on this stuff has become so polarized yeah the fact that a bit of plain speaking there from someone who's not bunkered in on one side or the other has become a remarkable thing yes and you can go viral just on just by changing your view yeah how on earth do we get out of that mm. space i can surely it, that is for, for me that is the bigger problem you know our institutional relationship with brexit is kind of a, an interesting issue not three worth, years worth of interesting but this incredible polarization and, and bitterness in the discourse is big, way more of a big problem as far as I can see. I, I fully agree, and, and it's, a, it's a worry. And, you know, look in America, how environmentalism is now a political issue. It's been weaponized, you know, if you're an environmentalist, you're on the left, you know, and, and you can't be Republicans. Um, and and, and it, is, it is a worry because I think it's compounded by social media, but what we have um, is obviously some real issues, but we have... Um, we have a lack of ability to be able to have a bit of dissent and a bit of straight talking. And we need a bit of dissent because we need debate because without debate, there's only polarization. 
And that's when the finger pointing starts and the thinking stops. And that's the issue. You know, Brexit is an example of, of which there are many, as you've alluded to, and it's more of a worrying overall theme uh, whereby it doesn't matter the nuance of the debate or what you believe is just which side you're on and people seem to just become more entrenched. Yeah, I I can understand a vision of change for how we get to a world that is sustainable more easily than I can envisage a route to change <laughs> to where we heal these current divisions, which I find yeah. really remarkable because the former should be the bigger problem by yeah. far. Yeah. But still. So where do you see the future for sustainable business in in many ways people say well it's all very well for for richard and iceland and mm. because they're a private company so they can be bold in this area do you have a sense of how now that we have this vision of governments and various businesses saying yes we're going to aim to be net carbon zero by mm. 2050 do you think the mainstream of business is going to follow down that path or are there real battles that we still have to overcome before that's going to happen? I think they, they can because a, a lot of people genuinely want to now and, and recognise that there is a climate emergency. But also I think they'll be forced to anyway because the market will correct itself as competitors uh, seek to, to become more sustainable. And I suppose the ultimate vision is, um, you know, a, a government that is taxing things that we don't want, like pollution, and not taxing things that we do want like jobs and and then we can create a system whereby companies compete on how environmentally responsible they are uh, the problem we have at the moment is that we just don't have time for the good guys to rise to the top you know that there is a climate emergency and therefore 2050 is is probably too late and i, I am a free marketeer i'm obviously you know, uh, into um, low government in interference and regulation. However, I think the environmental debate is different. I think the government really does have an opportunity to uh, step in and at a time of Brexit, you know, uh, create some world leading environmental um, policies. And I, I spoke to the um, prime minister, our previous prime minister about this just before she left office. Um, and I think they still have a way to go in terms of recognising how how um, dramatically and seriously they, they need to act. 